Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to this talk. My name is Dimitri, and today I'll be talking about modern estrays. Uh, so estrays is a Linux system called tracer from user space with the older history. So what is modern estrays? Well, it depends. For the purpose of this talk, modern estrays is all the features accumulated since the previous talk I made at DevConf, which was also called Modern Estrays. <laughs> so if you're interested at those things that used to be modern those days, you can have a look at that talk. But now we'll be talking about very new features, actually since 2019. Uh, you can, oh, quite a lot of them, for, for these several years. There are several groups of features. Those that affect tracing process itself. Uh, most features that are about the tracing output, what would you like to see? Or a few features about filtering, what you don't like to see. And a few features about tampering, how would you like to change what you see. Also, uh, uh, one summer option and one funny option that makes a stress show you some tips. So let's start this uh, with this feature, which is probably most impressive of all. Uh, uh, this example you see, it's an infamous example used to demonstrate how slow a trace could be, how slow the programs it traces could be. And eventually, we have a feature that makes the, all these things upside down. That is, trace no longer slows, slows things down that way. Uh, by installing the second BPF program, uh, <coughs> The traced program runs almost as fast as untraced one. As you can see from these statistics, it's exactly the same example people used to show uh, demonstrating how, how slow things are. So you see just maybe 10% difference when the high I.O. loaded uh, process is under a trace with CCOMP PPF enabled compared to like 40 times slower. It looks too good to be true, right? However, it's really that good. But uh, there are some limitations. Uh, maybe these limitations are not that important for you, but you should know about them just to choose the right tool for you. Uh, because of the nature of second programs, that you can install but can remove, or you are naturally forced to use follow forks mode because uh, the second program is inherited on forks. So unless you specify follow forks, this option second PPF is no option. Also, it, it is not compatible with any option that detaches a trace. For the, essentially the same reason, you can stop this program. And what will happen if program still stays, but the tracer is no longer there? This second red trace stops, uh, which, uh, which are used to, to communicate with, uh, with the tracer, they turn into uh, second red Erno stops, which effectually disable those syscalls. And this is probably not the thing you want the program to do, like in the following example. Uh, it's kind of an uh, artificial example, but from this example, you can see how bad this could go. We're just tracing exit groups as call. And when there is no secomp, we just detach a trace and nothing odd is happening. But, well, in case of premature stress termination, uh, there is no way for the tracy to, to work normally after its tracer 
was detached. So it actually seek faults because at the moment of exit group, it can't perform this system call. And then it goes to or uh, held a thing, uh, instruction that, or something like this, it depends on the architecture, and actually seek faults. So it affects the behavior of this process. So while SIGCOMP uh, uh, instrumentation in Australia is really fast, there are cases where you can't use it. Just you should be aware of this. So this is the reason why you can, not for example, enable it by default. Uh, there, well, there's a quite old feature uh, that enables a trace to demonize itself. By default, when you run program under a trace, uh, it just forks a tracy uh, and it, it runs a, as a child process. But in some cases, you don't want to uh, you don't want for a trace to be visible, so things are turned upside down and the parent process is the trace itself, and the trace is going as a child, or actually as a grandchild, because it forks twice, so not to be uh, the direct child of the trace, so it wouldn't be that visible that way. Uh, it's quite an old option. Uh, it exists since 2011, I think. Uh, so, yeah, for example, if you run something under timeout, uh, there, there is a clear difference because timeout is sending signal to, to this process, and when it stays, it detaches to early, so you can see the output. So why I'm talking about a feature which is more than 10 years old? Because it's not enough. Simple demonizing is not enough, as you can see in this example. When, for example, you are sending the secure, it kills the strays anyway, because it's, uh, it's the, the signal is sent to the process group. So we added a, an option to uh, also move demonized trace to a separate process group. Actually, you can specify triple D to move the trace to a separate session if you need this. But for this timeout example, it's enough just to move to a separate process group. So this way, a trace is... Uh, not affected by signals sent to, to its tracing. There are some ideas maybe to enable this, demoni this demonizing mode by default, I mean demonizing with moving to the separate process group, but the previous behavior existed for too long, so we don't know. Maybe somebody is assuming the traditional behavior and we are like too picky about backwards compatibility, so we decided we would rather add a new, uh, this option. It's a, another option that controls uh, stray's behavior, which is very recent, is the ability to stop tracing after a sp specified number of system calls, which are those that are not filtered. So if you are tracing just a few syscalls, only those you are tracing are taken into account. Uh, people suggest this could be useful for some automated testing scenarios to uh, attach to some running process and capture whatever they are interested in number of system calls and attach. And in this quite artificial example, I demonstrate the, the way how I use this sometimes. When I want to, uh, to attach to a process that generates a lot of system calls, but I want just a few of them. I just attach, uh, uh, grab these few system calls, and detach. So for that kind of purpose, it's very handy. And this is a very simple feature. Uh, uh, like, if you are developing a some multiplexer program like Komoot or Busybox, uh, which is a program that has uh, uh, several names, and its behavior depends on the name. So it's a very easy, easy way to test this program or affect its behavior without installing. Because when it's installed, you can use its regular, regular alias name, but when it's not, this is a very simple. 
So moving to features uh, that control various aspects of a stress output. These new features allow you to, to see what's behind uh, process IDs. For example, you can, you, can, you can see what's the program name behind, behind process IDs you, you see in, in the output. The option is called the code beats, uh, com, com is a proc beat com. That's where it came from. It also has, it ho also has a short alias dash big Y uh, uh, because, uh, uh, because the decode, decode file descriptors uh, option has alias dash small y. So it's kind of analogous. When you are tracing programs that are creating pid name spaces, uh, sometimes you want to see not just the process ID that visible to these traced processes, but also the process ID how it how it looks uh, from the trace process namespace. Why it could be useful? Because otherwise you wouldn't easily see which process is which. For, for example, when, well, as you can see here, like process with P2 and 3 is actually process you see later in the, in the left column. So you can actually see which process is which. And really you can combine both of this, like display both common names and P namespace translation. And this way it's, it's even more visible, so you can see the program name, kind of, the process com contains, and the bit in the target namespace, and bit in the stress namespace, and it's clearly visible. So, uh, in this example, I use uh, option decode bits all, because it's more handy, and maybe someday we'll have alias dash double big I. Uh, I don't really know why we don't yet have this alias. It reminds me of dash double small I, which corresponds to decoding file descriptors information, which I'll be exactly talking about now. Uh, we have one more feature to decode file description information. It's information uh, associated with signal of DE file descriptors. So it's quite handy when you see system call accepting some signal of the descriptor, and you can see right away the signal mask associated with it. Looks nice. Also, you can see a serious context associated with process IDs, with file descriptors and with file names. So the same, exactly the same example with the, if without this information, as you can see, it might be quite handy if you use SC Linux. This is a, a short form, and this is the, the, the full form. It's so lengthy. By the way, all these strange looking errors you see, they are not produced by SCS. So far, SCS doesn't produce funny-looking errors. Uh, errors. Also, funny-looking errors is, it also doesn't produce. Unfortunately, stress output with full uh, Linux context is, is very lengthy. So you can see like something very long. And another feature which is probably really important for those who are debugging some strange uh, Linux related errors is uh, showing off uh, Linux context mismatch. Like in this very artificial example, assuming that there is a file with a, a Linux context that doesn't match the database, uh, a Linux will uh, uh, keeps this information. Uh, the, uh, the information is, is in the database is that it is unconfined and uh, actually it's its system so 
a trace in this uh, second text full mismatch mode would show the difference. Uh, you can see how long these lines could be, but if you're using a synth, you wouldn't be surprised anyway. And you can also show syscall numbers, which is kind of strange why we would need a syscall numbers. You need system calls and not the system call numbers. But here's an example. There is a one dying architecture called x86, which used to have and still has a few multiplexing system calls, like socket call. And there are still libc libraries that are using this system call for backwards compatibility. So if for some reason you want to know exactly which way this system call was, this socket call was called, di via direct system call or via uh, a socket call, uh, you can use this. Okay, let's talk about, talk about filtering now. Uh, we have a feature that was announced many years ago uh, as a dash Z option. It was announced but never worked. And only in 2019, with a proper return status filtering, it actually works. So you can filter system calls by its uh, exit code. You can filter and show just only successful syscalls or only failed or some combinations. By default, it, of course, shows everything, but you can see how this be useful from this example. Like, if you want to see just only successful syscalls, you, you probably would use this short option because it's really short. But if you want to, to see something less common, like those system calls that don't finish, you, could, you would use the long option. A one less obvious consequence of using this uh, status filtering is aggregation. For, is, for the obvious reason, a trace doesn't know whether it would print or would skip uh, a particular syscall until it finished, it prints it at the moment it decides whether, whether it should be printed or not. So it no longer prints uh, all this popular unfinished and resumed stuff, which could clutter the output, as you can see in this example. This is without aggregation, and this is the same thing, but with aggregation. But be careful, it could confuse you. Uh, from this output, you could think that these nano-slip system calls were issued in this particular order. But you remember from the previous slide that they're invoked almost simultaneously. So the consequence of this segregation is kind of reordering the output. But there is no other way to, if you want to see whole lines, and you don't know whether they will be seen or not. It's probably the only way. Or, or aggregate afterwards. Like we, we have actually an aggregating program, but it's not modern. It's from a previous talk, sorry. Uh, you can also filter system calls by the file descriptions numbers. So a trace would show you just those system calls that operate on the specified set of file descriptions. Like in this um, small program, oops, just a regular cut program. Uh, but the idea is that if you can filter by path, uh, by path to file, for example, there is no path at all. Like if it's, uh, I don't know, signal of D file descriptor, which doesn't have any path. So you can use this. Maybe it's another slide. We, uh, every now and then, we add more system call filtering classes because people cannot and shouldn't remember uh, which particular system call names are, exist on, on this, on that, or that architecture. So there are groups like 
we added two groups for filtering system calls related to file credentials and to system clocks. Oh, okay. Poke injection is nice. We had we have various kinds of system call injection for quite some time. But so far, we didn't uh, inject anything into memory. So this new feature allows you to inject not just into uh, exit status of a system call, or, but right into the memory referenced by system call arguments. In this somewhat artificial example, I substitute the second argument of OpenNet system call by changing the stream itself from etc shadow for to some different name. So the system call succeeds. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not that easy to, to tell what's the file name, because it's a hex string, and you probably can that easily read this hex string. It's a pity. But this is the interface we use. And also, you can inject uh, uh, into memory after exiting system calls. So uh, when Injecting this return value is not enough. You can inject actual value that the system call would have returned if it would have been called. So in this example, uh, not just the system call value is injected, but the, the actual value. Uh, but in this case, you can see uh, what this hex is about. It's the string read by Riddling program. But maybe, Maybe it's a good idea to, to add some interface to the strings poke injection to accept actual strings. So it would be a bit more readable. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, we have one more option to control, uh, to, to control a statistics output. Because we, we f for the last few years, we added a few features uh, for gathering statistics. We can gather more different information about system calls. But by default, we show this. This is what we show by default. But if you look into the mind page, you would see that there are more of them. Uh, and for example, you can specify this or some other parameters you are really interested in. So, okay, uh, the, the, the last but not least feature is, is uh, called dash dash tips. It makes the uh, styles show you various tips, tricks, and tweaks. It was made initially as a April Fool's joke, but it was too good to be kept just as a joke. So, he, it became an integral part of this trace. And uh, in the beginning, you had to see some actual trace output before seeing this uh, tip. Uh, but now, uh, the latest uh, release, you can just see the tip without tracing anything. Uh, you can specify which particular tips you would like to see, but by default, it will show you some random tip which is kind of nice. So let's have a look how one of the funnest tips looks like. OK. Tip number 31 says, medicinal effects of a stress can be achieved by invoking it with the following set of options. Medicinal effects of a stress. What? Mm -hmm. Actually, this phrase was coined by somebody who really used this phrase to request some feature how to use a trace to make programs that don't work actually work. Because sometimes some buggy programs don't work in a regular way, but 
for some reason, because they are too buggy, they wrote just under a stress. So that person wanted this to be documented. And now he or she, I don't know, uh, should be happy. This is documented. Uh, there is some, something I, I, in this idea, because what a stress does is in this mode, it doesn't do any printing. All it does is it makes the traces stop twice on every system call. So this affects the order in which programs are executing their system calls. So less traces, slower execution, and some bugs don't manifest itself. Okay, so maybe the last thing I w wanted to say is tomorrow you can attend a few more talks in this kind of unofficial mini conference about this trace. Tomorrow, Eugene would be talking about current state of Netlink decoding. And Renault would be talking about using a trace to troubleshoot is issues. This is going to be in room G202. I don't know where this room is, but please find it. <laughs> so thank you, and I'm ready to answer your questions. <laughs> Uh, it's not that easy to tell because, uh, uh, yeah, okay, great. Thank you so much. So the question was, how many tips a stress currently has? And the answer is that it's not specified and it's subject to grow. Uh, and you can't easily tell because if you specify the number uh, greater than it is, it would round up to, to the feature number, uh, well, it just rounds up. So you can't easily tell. If you, uh, if you watch feature, uh, or if you watch tip one by one, you would notice that you've already seen this. And this probably means that you've seen all the tips. But maybe, the stress version is not fresh enough. Maybe in the next version we'll add some more. So kind of, these numbers are kind of stable, but we don't promise this. So you should, in every new version, you should check all these tips once more. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, this means that uh, the, the question was uh, what would happen uh, if uh, tips would be called with, with, with parameter none. It's the way to, to turn tips off. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Yeah. Print no tip. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's it. Very simple. This means that you can specify tip and then tips equals none, and then tips, and it will honor the latest you specify. It's the, it, this is the, the way. So Eugene wanted to add that uh, they use, they, they, they use we, we follow this behavior with most of, the, most of the options, or maybe all options, for the reason that if you use some alias or a wrapper that uses a trace, so you could always specify something on top and it would override. Yeah. We have a few more minutes for any questions. I think so. Yeah. Can you talk about any um, specific error 
the question was, can the stress filter for a specific or no? I don't think, no. Uh, no, I don't think you can. But I don't know why. <laughs> it makes sense. Maybe nobody yet came up with a punch. Could be the reason. Sorry, I didn't get the, the question. What do you want to replace with what? Um, with the code. Uh, okay, the so. End to exit, uh, it doesn't matter, okay. It looks like this is only overriding memory. So yeah, I think. To change the register, like the actual IP location. Like, say I wanted to change SD1 to SD2 on the register somewhere. So the question was whether, I, whether or injection or any other uh, injection could change system call arguments. And we don't yet have this for some reason. Maybe for the same reason. Nobody yet contributed anything. Uh, Eugene says that he believes it's not possible to every architecture, but we don't have to support a uh, feature for every architecture. For example, SICOM BPF programs are probably not supported on some architectures that don't support SICOM BPF. So this shouldn't be a big problem. Uh, yeah. But we would have to come up with an interface and somebody would have to implement it, I think. Or unless the feature would implement itself. I don't know. Okay. Any more questions? No? If there are no more questions, then we'll probably can say thank you.